In the introductory video, I told you that Monte Carlo methods were about using the computer in order to perform simulations. That is probably going to remain abstract until we do an example. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to do an example. We're going to actually look at the central limit theorem and we're going to do a simulation to see the central limit theorem in action. Now, the central limit theorem is, as the name implies, a theorem and it has been proven. So we don't need a simulation to show that it works. But it's kind of nice that we have the opportunity to take something that we know what's going to happen and then show when we do our simulation that that indeed is what does happen. Because later on what I want to do is use simulation where I don't have a theorem, where I don't know what's going to happen. And then we're going to use simulation to actually provide us information about the properties of a statistic or a statistical test. So we're going to start with comparing simulation to something we know, knowing what the outcome is going to be, seeing how nicely that matches up. And then later on, we'll move into terrain in which we're not sure what the answers are going to be and use simulation to help give us as close as an approximation as possible to those answers. So let's remind ourselves how the central limit theorem works. The distribution of the sum of n independent identically distributed random variables will approach a normal distribution as n increases towards infinity. n here is our sample size. So this means that if we take a large enough sample size and then take one of the values from our observations and add those all together for each member of the sample, that that sum is going to approach a normal distribution and the bigger n is, the closer we would expect to be to that normal distribution. So this is still kind of abstract, so let's take it a little step further. Let's look at applying the central limit theorem to the sample mean. If you look at the formula for the sample mean, what do you see in the numerator? You see a sum, a sum of y, where y represents an observation. So we have observations from 1 to n. Each of those observations, we assume, have been randomly selected from the same population. So we indeed are taking a random selection, random variables, from the same population. So the underlying population is going to have the same distribution for each of our observations. And we're adding them up. So we know from the central limit theorem that because we've added all these things up, that this statistic we're getting, which is y bar, because after we add, we divide by n, that statistic should, in fact, be a normal distribution, assuming that n is large enough. When a random sample is drawn from a population, the sample mean is calculated from the sum of the randomly drawn observations from the same population, so the distribution of the mean will approach a normal distribution as the sample size increases. Furthermore, if you look at the classical formulation of the central limit theorem, there's a couple other things we can say about that particular normal distribution when it is a sampling distribution of the mean. The mean of those means, that is the mean of the sampling distribution that we generate, is equal to the original population mean, the mean from the original scores. So that means that our sample statistic, the mean, is unbiased because that's what it means to be unbiased, that the mean of your statistic over many, 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 many random samples is equal to the mean of the population where you're trying to estimate the mean. The standard deviation of the means, that is the sampling distribution, which is made up of means, it is made up of that statistic, that standard deviation is equal to the original population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. What does that tell us? 
Well, we see here in this formula that as n gets bigger, that will have a smaller standard deviation of means. In other words, those means are going to become more and more compact. That distribution is going to become more and more compact, smaller and smaller standard deviation around the population mean. In other words, the mean is a consistent estimator because that's what consistency means. As you get bigger and bigger samples, you actually have less variation from the true population mean. So the sample mean is an unbiased and consistent estimator. And we have all this information mathematically. We know that the standard deviation is going to um, provide us consistency, the standard deviation of the mean. We know that the mean of the means is going to equal the population mean. And we know that the distribution of those means is going to be normal. So all of this is known. So we're not doing a simulation here to show something new. We're doing a simulation to see how well simulations can match with what we already know. So let me go ahead and call up a, an R uh, instance here and an R notebook that I've created called Studying the Central Limit Theorem. You can download this notebook and try this yourself. I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to use simulation to see the central limit theorem in action by looking at the sampling distribution of the mean. And the first thing I'm going to do is obtain a picture of a uniform distribution population of scores. So we're going to use a uniform distribution as our original population distribution. I didn't want to use a normal distribution because that wouldn't be very surprising to have a normal distribution for the sampling distribution when the original population distribution is also normal. So I'm going to use a uniform distribution. Let's take a look at the population. Well, now we really can't look at the population. The underlying populations are typically unaccessible, but if I were to take, say, 100,000 scores from the population, we're going to get a pretty good picture of that population. And that's exactly what I'm doing here, is I'm going to take 100,000 scores from the population and then use the histogram function just to see what it looks like. And there indeed is exactly what we expected. Well, not exactly. I've got little bumps there. But it's pretty close to what we expected. And that is a uniform distribution. And this particular uniform distribution, notice that I created it with the parameters of a minimum score of 0 and a maximum score of 50. And that's, in fact, what we're seeing here in this particular um, picture of our population. Not really our population, but I think 100,000 is close enough. Now let's suppose we're mere mortal researchers. We don't have a huge grant. We cannot, in fact, get 100,000 observations. So we're going to go have to go to our population and draw a limited sample. Let's suppose we can afford to look at 100 observations. So I'm going to draw from this same uniform population here. I'm using the R unif function. R has a lot of nice uh, underlying distribution functions so that you can sample from those using basically pseudo-random number generation. This is pseudo-random numbers from a uniform distribution. The R in this function name stands for random and the UNIF stands for uniform. So I'm going to draw from a uniform population with a minimum of zero and a maximum of 50. I'm going to draw a sample of size 100. And then I'm going to look at the picture. And it does not look just like a uniform distribution because we're no longer seeing the population. And that's the way statistics work. When we take a sample, 
we're not actually going to be able to get a true picture of the population. The bigger the sample, the more closely we would expect the picture to represent that of the population, but often we take small samples and samples are gonna vary from time to time. That is, if I were to take multiple random samples here, let me actually do it. Let me uh, let you be able to see this screen while I run this a couple times. There's another sample, there's another sample, there's another sample, and so on. Obviously, in our research studies, we only take one sample. But knowing what would happen if we were to take many, 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 many samples is what allows us to make inferences. That is, the sampling distribution. A sampling distribution is simply a distribution of a statistic, in this case the mean, that is calculated from drawing, theoretically, an infinite number of samples. Now, in our simulation study, when we draw samples, we're not going to be able to draw an infinite number. We don't have enough time. But we can draw a large number of samples. I'm going to draw 10,000 of them. So I am here simulating the drawing of 10,000 samples of size 100 from a population. And I'm going to calculate the mean of each of these, and I'm going to store that mean. So here I'm going to go ahead and run this. And now let's look at a picture of our 10,000 means. In other words, we're looking at a picture that is an estimate of the sampling distribution. If I could draw an infinite number of samples, we'd actually see the true sampling distribution. But let's call 10,000 close enough. So let's go here and look at that picture. And there it is. And you can see in that picture that what we have here is what appears to be a more of a bell-shaped distribution, like a normal distribution. And that's a sampling distribution of the mean. The central limit theorem said it would be normal no matter what our underlying population distribution was. Our underlying population distribution was uniform, but we ended up with a normal sampling distribution. Now, let's check a couple other things here. I say check, but we, we really know what should happen because it's been mathematically proven. But let's see how good our simulation does at reaching what we know should happen. So when we have a uniform distribution, the mean of a uniform distribution is this. And I'm calling up a little box here to show you the formula. It's mu equals the minimum that is the lower bound of the uniform distribution, remember I set that at zero, plus the maximum, the upper bound, I set that as 50, divide it by two. There's nothing really surprising here. This just basically says that the mean is the midpoint, right in the middle of that uniform distribution. So that will be the mean, and our standard deviation of a uniform distribution. This one's not as obvious, but here's the formula. The standard deviation of a uniform distribution is we take the upper bound, the maximum, minus the lower bound. So in our case, that would be 50 minus zero. We square that, we divide it by 12 and take the square root, and that's the standard deviation. So I can actually do those calculations here. Let's do it. And that tells us that for our uniform distribution that ranges from 0 to 50, the mean is going to be 25 and the standard deviation is going to be 14.4, about 3. Okay, now let's actually take our simulated distribution, the one I showed you up here. There's the picture. This was made up of 10,000 means, not original scores, but means, means of samples of size 100. And so when we come down here and look at this formula I'm using here, what I'm doing is taking the mean of those 10,000 sample means. I'm taking the mean of those means and the standard deviation of those means. And what I'm hoping will happen is that from these, 
I can get close to what I expected. So let's see what we've got here. All right. For the mean of the means, we're supposed to equal the population mean. Look what we got. 24.98. It's not exactly 25 because we did not take an infinite number of samples. We took 10,000. We have a long ways further to go to take an infinite number. But that's pretty darn close, When not you say? We ended up with just about 25, 24.98, and we expected to get 25. Now, what about the standard deviation of means? Well, we're not quite there yet. We're at 1.44, not 14.4. But remember that to calculate the standard deviation of our sampling distribution, we have to take the population standard deviation, that's what the 14.4 is, and divide it by the square root of the sample size. So let me do that. And now look at that. What we ended up, the value that we theoretically calculated we should get, 1.44, is what we empirically got with our simulation, 1.44. All right, so I've got two things under my belt. The mean of the means equaled the population mean, and the standard deviation of the means equaled the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, exactly what we had expected. We also got a distribution that looked like it was kind of normal, but let's do a little bit more investigation now that we've done some calculations for the um, population and, and, and uh, sampling distribution values. Right here, I talk about on line 86, I'm gonna pick a couple quantiles for our theoretical sampling distribution. That is the one that we know we would have in the long run if we had done an infinite number of samples based on the central limit theorem. I'm gonna pick the 25th, 75th, and 90th percentiles. So let's go ahead and see what those are. So here is what they would be theoretically. Now let's see what we did empirically. And notice what I'm doing here. I am adding up, I'm adding up how many of our sample means we had under the 25th um, value here, this one, the 24, which is the theoretical. How many values do we have in our empirical distribution that are under the 25th percentile of a theoretical distribution? How many of those? And then I'm gonna take the proportion of those out of 10,000, and I'm multiplying here by 100 to turn it into a percent. I'm doing the same thing for the 75th percentile and the same thing for the 90th. Here we go. Look at that, 25% were beneath the 25th percentile on the theoretical distribution, 75%, 74.9, basically 75% were beneath the theoretical 75th percentile, and 90% were beneath the theoretical 90th percentile. So not only did that sampling distribution way back up here look like it was a bell-shaped distribution, down here we actually calculated a few percentiles and found out they matched what we would expect with a normal distribution. So indeed, we ended up with an empirical sampling distribution that was very close to what theory predicted. We did not prove anything, only the mathematical proof can do that. Whereas we just looked at a single example and no amount of examples will offer proof. But each example can provide a nice illustration of what the mathematics told us would happen.